Vice President, thanks for taking a few minutes to talk with us. My pleasure. Thank you. You have a new book out, which uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes. But first, I just have to ask you, since uh, the next UN, a round of UN climate talks at Copenhagen is coming at us pretty quickly, um, what I'm getting lately it looks like a lot of expectations, management kind of downward. Uh, are you happy with the tone right now going into these talks? I think there's still a, a good chance that they will get a binding political agreement among the leaders of the nations gathering there that will bring about the beginnings of significant reductions and will also provide a, as a set of instructions for the negotiators to fill in the details in the months following Copenhagen. So you think something specific and binding can come out of Copenhagen? I think a binding political, agree political agreement can be reached uh, in, in Copenhagen. Uh, it is now uh, becoming a meeting that many heads of state uh, are attending, and there's a lot of work underway furiously right now to try to, to get the basics of that agreement. One person who uh, will be in Copenhagen with a seemingly bottomless well of optimism is California's governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, along with a pretty good size entourage of state officials. Uh, we're presumably spending a lot of money to send them. Uh, do you think that California can play a meaningful role in a process which ultimately depends on decisions of national and even multinational leaders? Well, California, as is often uh, pointed out, w would be uh, one of the biggest economies in the world were it a, a separate nation. And there have been uh, plenty of times, including during the previous eight years, when the United States federal government was not willing to act, and yet California did act. And that, I can tell you personally, that has served as a source of hope and inspiration to a lot of countries around the world that uh, were beginning to kind of question whether the U.S. was ever going to do anything. And the fact that California stepped in to provide leadership has been uh, really very important. And Governor Schwarzenegger has a, a voice that's listened to in, in these councils, and I think it's very appropriate that he's going. And I think California's record of success in addressing these issues in a way that has created jobs in California is a very important lesson. How do you feel about California's own efforts? Um, you know, we have our own carbon legislation, as you know, yes. since 2006. Much of that yet to be implemented, uh, implemented uh, three years later. Are you satisfied with the way, it, by the shorthand of AB 32, that that, that is playing out? Well, I, I think that you've already seen the creation of a lot of new businesses and a lot of new jobs because the solar and wind industry and the green tech, clean tech sector generally is now more or less based in California. And I think the reason for that is, in large part, the willingness of the citizens of California to support a leadership role for this state uh, in ensuring the emergence of that whole new industry right here. But I want to ask you about this concept of, you know, clean, green tech jobs. The, the, there's been a tremendous amount of hype around this, particularly in California over the last year or so, about the hundreds of thousands of jobs that it could potentially create. Now, the folks at factcheck.org, based on advertising, uh, some advertising, kind of did some study on this and, and say that claims the bill would create hundreds of thousands, they're talking about the national carbon uh, legislation bill, claims that bill would create hundreds of thousands of green jobs are misleading at best the government's own official economic projections indicate more jobs will be lost than created. Is this explosion of green economic growth being overhyped? Well, I don't buy that analysis and haven't seen that analysis, but I can tell you it, uh, it, it, it's obvious already with the number of homes and businesses that are being retrofitted with new windows, new lighting, insulation. Uh, and other advances to save money on energy bills and cut pollution, th there are a lot of jobs being created by that uh, activity alone. And the, the burgeoning uh, interest in solar power and wind power, soon uh, enhanced geothermal power, uh, the building of this super grid uh, nationally, there will be not hundreds of thousands but millions of jobs. Uh, recently, I saw this company uh, in Ohio, just to pick one example, uh, Cardinal Fasteners. They made the bolts for the Golden Gate Bridge mm -hmm. and also for the Statue of Liberty, and this is a part of their proud history. 
but they fell on some tougher times until recently when they started hiring people back to make bolts for windmills. Mm -hmm. And it's a small example that's replicated many times around the country. What we're facing now is an unprecedented new effort to switch away from coal and oil toward renewable energy that doesn't put global warming pollution into the atmosphere. Other nations are racing to dominate that new industry. Uh, I was recently in China two weeks ago. They will soon be the number one solar and wind power. They're building the largest supergrid in the world. They're taking dramatic steps because they see this as the industry of the future. Electric cars, look at the new electric car companies in California. Every nation that has an automotive industry is now racing to dominate this huge 21st century marketplace where everyone anticipates that there's going to be a conversion to plug in electric hybrids and, and, and all electric uh, cars. Uh, and yet another example of the new jobs that are going to be created. Uh, it's think. called Our Choice. It's a kind of a sequel to Inconvenient Truth, yes. where the former was sort of the fire bell in the night, basically mm -hmm. uh, pointing to the on, uh, oncoming crisis. This one is more or less a, a guide to how to respond. Would that be a fair yes, summation it, of it? Yes, it, it, it outlines all of the significant solutions to the climate crisis uh, and identifies some of the obstacles that have to be removed in order to implement those solutions. And, and one of the things you assert in the book is uh, that the tools are at hand. Yes. All yeah. we need, I'm quoting you, quoting from the book, all we need is the collective will. And yet, if you look not so much at California, but at the national polling, uh, some of the recent polls recently from the Pew, the Pew Research Center, for example, showing that just people who buy the basic premise of global warming, not even talking about the cause, just the basic premise that it's happening, those numbers are dropping. They're not rising from 7 in 10 a year ago down to a little more than half now. Why does this continue to be such a tough sell? Well, that poll was something of a so-called outlier. The overall trend in the polls has been steadily rising support for tackling this crisis. And that's true not only in the United States, but in countries all around the world. Uh, naturally, in hard economic times, that uh, has an impact. Uh, there's a classic uh, factor when a president is in power who people believe is trying to solve the problem. They let down their guard a little bit. But overall, the support for tackling this crisis has still been growing. Uh, it will take time, but we don't have the luxury of a lot of time because the scientific community worldwide is repeatedly warning us that there are tipping points that we could cross that would make it very difficult to solve this if we don't act soon. But if the uh, recession is a factor in this, in the, in the skepticism, if you will, or if it's influencing how people feel um, about climate change, um, doesn't that imply that a lot of people do believe it will be a drag on the economy? No, I think that it just simply uh, means that for some people their, their immediate priorities uh, may, may shift a bit. But even there, the economic crisis has actually firmed up the consensus that we need a green stimulus, which is already beginning to work, we need more of it, to put people to work building these new energy systems and retrofitting homes, making our economy more efficient. There, there is in almost every country uh, a, a, an effort now to put people back to work by focusing on this new green infrastructure. Can, can I read you one a sure. quick uh, excerpt from, from your book? This is uh, from, uh, from the section on uh, uh, global warming has uh, often been described as the greatest market failure in history. And it says, you wrote, apparently, it is now apparent that the climate crisis is posing an unprecedented threat not only to the future livability of the planet, but also to our assumptions about the ability of democracy and capitalism to recognize this threat for what it is and respond. Mm. That's quite a statement for a man who was vice president of the biggest capitalist democracy in the world. Uh, well, You're basically saying, we don't have the mechanism. No, I, that, that, that's not precisely what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that uh, I mean, I support capitalism and support democracy, obviously. Uh, but what I am saying is that thus far, uh, we have not stepped up to this challenge effectively. 
I think the day is fast approaching when we will. But, but the essential ingredient is your viewers deciding that they themselves personally want to be a part of the solution. Because elected officials ultimately are going to respond to strongly held beliefs by their constituents. And of course, California has offered a, a, a lot of great leadership on this issue. But the, the, the Congress uh, as a whole has been slow to respond to it. The, the way to change that is for more individuals to not only change their light bulbs and windows, but to help change the laws and policies by being active in their role as citizens to insist that this be uh, taken on. But in the meantime, I mean, the, 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 the market economy that we have and even the political system we have does have some shortcomings when it comes to trying to deal with this, does it not, like short-term thinking? Yes, uh, we're predisposed to short-term thinking. Uh, we inherited that from our ancestors who survived threats in their world, sort of different from the ones we face. But we also have the long-term thinking ability, and uh, specifically we have the ability to form long-term goals based on deep values that are shared. Uh, and then we have the ability to stay on course. We did that with the Marshall Plan. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples of where uh, we as Americans have, have risen to a challenge that requires a long-term commitment to bold action. This is such a time. And whatever the shortcomings of our political system in responding thus far, uh, it is capable of moving swiftly as soon as enough citizens make it clear that's what they want. In fact, you say in the book that uh, what, what is required here is globally a massive change in human behavior and thinking. Well, there haven't been too many times in history where we've seen that, have there? Yeah, there have been, yeah. sure. Uh, th there have been uh, plenty of examples. More recently, think about the campaign against smoking. Smoking rates uh, stayed very high and continued to go up even after the Surgeon General's report. But after a persistent effort to change that behavior and thinking, uh, there, there has been a change. Think about seat belts. Uh, think about how the great cathedrals of Europe were built by multiple generations who stayed on task for many, many decades. Think about the commitment that the greatest generation after World War II made to rebuild Europe with the Marshall Plan and to form NATO. They stayed on task for 40 years and, and more and changed the world for the better. We, we don't see that kind of response all the time, but at key moments when our survival depends upon it, we draw on that deep capacity that does exist within us. And you think that institutionally we're still able to do that? Oh yeah, no question about it. Now, candidly, I, I have to also say that the, the power of special interest money in our political system is larger now than it has been in the past. It has reached unhealthy levels. But all that means is that grassroots sentiment has to be express, expressed forcefully uh, in order to overcome it. There are, right now as we speak, a couple of pilot, uh, large-scale pilot programs in carbon capture and sequestration going on in, in California. Um, this is the, the fundamental technology behind what they call clean coal. Um, this, this ability to basically siphon off the carbon dioxide from industrial processes and put it in the ground. Wasn't too long ago you were very skeptical about this technology, but it sounds like you've kind of come around a little bit. Well, no, I'm still skeptical about it, but uh, I've consistently said that I think it's more than justified to have ample research and development and large-scale demonstration projects. There have only been small demonstration projects thus far. All of the technologies work. They've just never been integrated and demonstrated on a large commercial scale. Uh, one reason for the burden of implausibility that this technology has to carry is that a standard coal fire, fire generating plant uh, has to, would have to divert one-third of the electricity it now produces and sells just to power the carbon capture and sequestration process. And these underground repositories have to be studied and characterized with great precision to make sure they're safe. Now, when that's done, I think it can be disposed of safely. But the expense, 
the time and the effort and the amount of resources required, all of that, uh, all of those stand as big obstacles to a widespread use of this technology. But no, I hope that it can be done, but it's going to take quite a long time to demonstrate whether it's a realistic uh, part of the solution or not. Speaking of coal, you know, it doesn't have a big, there's not a big coal presence in China, in uh, California, but there is in China. Yes. Although we talked with Amory Lovins recently, the founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, who you know well, and he said something very interesting. He said, China will lead us out of the climate mess. Hmm. You agree? Uh, it's possible. Uh, I just came back from Beijing two weeks ago, meeting with Wen Jiabao, the premier, and meeting with quite a few of the Chinese leaders on this issue. And it's pretty impressive uh, when you look at some of the changes over the last two years. Uh, in each of the last three years, they have planted two and a half times more trees than the entire rest of the world combined. They've just changed their five-year plan, uh, and officials will be evaluated for promotion according to a new formula in which CO2 reductions play a very important role. They'll soon be the number one solar power, the number one wind power, uh, the number one implementer of these smart grids. Uh, they're trying to dominate the electric car industry of the 21st century. Now, they're still opening another coal plant every eight or nine days, so it's, a, it's a, definitely a mixed picture. But I think the glass is more than half full, and the existence of a very strong consensus throughout Chinese society to solve this crisis is uh, very, very impressive. I think they're serious about it. And also related to China and other, other nations as well, um, it seems like the third rail of the climate discussion is population. Hmm. Do we need to address that? Sure, and I, I, I don't think it's a taboo subject uh, at all. In some countries, some elements of the issue, uh, fertility management, for example, hmm. can be controversial. But actually, this is a success story uh, in slow motion. Hmm. We have been seeing uh, the, the stabilizing of population growth. Uh, we have four times as many people as we did in 1900. And before population stabilizes halfway through this century, as the demographers predict, hmm. uh, they think it'll go slightly above 9 billion and, and stabilize. But the growth rate is already slowing. And the reason is there's a natural preference for small families if four conditions are present. The education of girls, the empowerment of women to participate in the decisions of their societies and communities and families, the availability for women to choose how many children to have and what the spacing of those children is, and most importantly, higher child survival rates because the confidence by parents, particularly in these developing countries, the confidence that their children will live uh, is really an important factor in shifting the uh, preference to smaller families. But the good news is we've already gone through that transition in the United States, Western Europe, Japan, a few other places, and every country in the world, including the developing countries, are beginning down that pathway to, towards smaller families. So this is, this is really uh, an unfolding success story even though we have to take into account that having four times as many people and soon more than five times as many people as in 1900 means that we collectively have a bigger footprint on the environment of the earth. Mr. Vice President, thanks for taking some time with us. Thank you. My pleasure.